our special guest today is Water Isaacson, and I'm very pleased that uh, Water has uh, flown in just uh, this morning, I guess, from overseas and came here to, to be our guest. Water has a distinguished background that I'll go through briefly, and then we'll go through uh, this extraordinary book that he's written. Uh, Water is a, a native of New Orleans, uh, graduated from Newman High School, which was also made famous by Eli Manning, having graduated from there. Is that right? Peyton, Peyton Manning, too. And um, went to Harvard College, a member of the Lampoon there, won a Rhodes Scholarship, went to Oxford, got a degree there, came back and became a journalist and part at the uh, part time at initially at the New, uh, New Orleans Times Picayune, which is his hometown newspaper. But in 1978, he joined Time magazine and rose up uh, to be in 1996 the editor in chief, the 14th editor in chief of Time magazine. He did that for a number of years, and then in 2001 became the president and CEO of CNN. And in 2003, uh, was recruited to be the president and CEO of the Aspen Institute, which he has dramatically reinvigorated and done an extraordinary job there. I've been in a number of their programs, and they're, they're quite remarkable, and, and Water deserves a great deal of credit for what he's done. Um, although he's also a full-time person running Aspen, he has a number of other things he's done on the side. Among them are, he's on the board of Tulane University from his hometown, a member of the Harvard Board of Overseers, a member of the foundation, the Bloomberg Family Foundation, a member of the United Airlines Board. He's also, uh, in his spare time, writing books. He's now written uh, biographies of Henry Kissinger, Benjamin Franklin, Albert Einstein, and Steve Jobs. And this is in the daytime when he's, uh, I guess, before he goes to work. So. Uh, it's an extraordinary book, and I think all of you who have read it, um, I think, recognize that the, the personality that Water captured is, is an unusually gifted personality and, and, and an extraordinary business person, and uh, as are some of the people that you've written about before. But let me ask you at the start, uh, you've written about four people that are extraordinary individuals. Um, Henry Kissinger, Albert Einstein, Benjamin Franklin, Steve Jobs. Um, who was the smartest of those? <laughs> Well, um, first of all, you know a lot of smart people, and this room is filled right. with smart people. And you realize that smart people uh, are a dime a dozen, and they don't usually amount to much. What really matters is whether you're imaginative you. okay. or creative. All right. Uh, obviously, the person who was both the smartest and the most imaginative was Einstein. I mean, um, but it was not conventional smarts that made Einstein what he was. Mm -hmm. In fact, in 1905, when he transforms the entire world of physics with the two great pillars that now stand in physics, relativity theory and quantum theory, uh, he was a third-class patent clerk at the Bern, Switzerland Patent Office because he couldn't get a job or even a doctorate at, a, at right. Zurich Polytech. Uh, so he was not conventionally smart, but unlike every other brilliant physicist of the time who were trying to figure out why is the speed of light constant, the patent clerk who was trying to synchronize clocks said, maybe it's because time is relative depending on your state of motion. It was an imaginative leap, not a smart right. leap that did it. Steve Jobs, in some ways, was the least conventionally smart. He said when he came back from India, and when he was, you know, 19 or 20 years old, he kind of dropped out, sought personal enlightenment in India. He said, I learned the limits of rational Western thinking and took up what I learned in the villages of India, which was intui intuition right. and intuitive thinking. So if you were to look at what's classic smarts, you would generally say Western rational thinking, the way a Bill Gates can process. Right massively a large amount of data and ideas and come up with an answer. For Steve Jobs, it was much more intuitive. Well, if you had a chance to have dinner with any one of those four people for two hours, or recommend anybody yeah. here, who would be the most interesting yeah. dinner companion? Well, two hours makes it different from one hour. Okay. You know. <laughs> uh, All right, one hour. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, you know, you know, it's uh, after an hour of Einstein, I'd be so intimidated, I'd be, <laughs> And uh, I'm going to leave Dr. Kissinger aside because every, half the people in this room have probably had dinner with him, and he's a delightful, you know, charming dinner partner. Clearly, Ben Franklin is the person you most want to spend more than an hour with. Somebody you, convivial, nice, interested in, you know, a hundred different fields. Um, 
you know, people said, gee, Steve Jobs seemed, besides being so, you know, uh, ingenious and everything else, so difficult at times. And there were times he was. I said, if you want nice, buy Ben Franklin. He was right. nice. Yeah. But is it easier to write a book about somebody who's deceased or somebody who's alive? Yeah, uh, well, I, after I wrote the book on Dr. Kissinger, um, which I thought was, uh, you know, straight down, he, I got, I think, seven or eight letters from him in a day and a half period that were hand delivered right, right. by Paul, Jerry Bremer, who was right. then working for him at Kissinger. You know, and everyone began, it is absolutely outrageous that, right. you know, you would say I had anything less than high regard for Gerald Ford's intelligence, you know. <laughs> so, and so for a, about six months, he didn't speak to me. Uh, Henry Grunewald, who you may know, right. who was my boss then at Time Inc., uh, was a friend of Kissinger's, and he uh, expressed his annoyance to Grunewald, who said, well, I thought Walter's book was fair and straight down the middle about you. And Dr. Kissinger said as a joke, I think, what right does that young man have to be fair and straight down the middle about a person like me? <laughs> so I swore after that I would not do anybody who had been live, alive for at least half a century because I didn't want to deal with them again. I think I'm about to make the same vow having dealt with Steve Jobs. Too. Well, now you're minding your own business, you're running the Aspen Institute, and all of a sudden Steve Jobs says, can you write a book about me? Why, what well, happened was in about? the summer of 2004 I got a call from Steve Jobs. I had known him intermittently since 1984 when he came as a young hotshot to show off the new uh, Macintosh, the Macintosh One. and. Uh, even then, in the conference room of Time magazine, as he demonstrated this new Apple computer, you could see both sides of Steve Jobs. He was passionate for the perfection of that product and showed exactly how the curves on in the bevels in each one of the industrial designs, each icon, the graphical, you know, just was going nuts about how great it was. But he was also furious at Time magazine for not making a man of the year the year before, which he thought he was going to be. And because Michael Moritz, who was then working right. at Time Magazine, had written a piece about Steve that wasn't up to what Steve wanted. And so I thought, well, this guy is totally mesmerizing. I came away kind of liking him. So I'll, over the years, we'd sort of be in touch now and then. And so he called me in 2004 and said, why not do a biography of me? And I'm thinking, all right, Benjamin Franklin, Albert Einstein, mm -hmm. you. You know, well, that's a little... Uh, Leap of much. Uh, and so I said, um, I, I said, yeah, maybe in 20, 30 years when you retire, you know, putting it off. And finally, um, it came back to me as somebody in family said, uh, if you're going to do Steve, you got to do him now. And I realized, oh, I hadn't really focused on the cancer being that he was really fighting it that badly. But um, how do you actually write a book when you have a full-time job? I mean, how do you have time to go out? You interviewed him 40 times. You had hundreds of other interviews. How do you actually physically do that? And when do you actually write, do the well, writing? definitely not what you said. I don't write in the morning. In fact, I believe that's okay. a, um, not my favorite day part. Uh, I, I don't watch TV, really, especially having recovered from CNN. Mm -hmm. I don't okay. watch TV in the evening. Uh, and you know my wife, Kathy, she's a morning person, so she loves to be sort of in bed reading by 9 p.m. I'm a night person, and I try every night to write between 9 p.m. and 1 or 2 a.m. When you do the research first, and then you write after all the research is done, or do you write? Oh, I would do about 80% of the research, and then as you're writing, you say, oh, man, I need this. Or in the case of somebody like Steve, who is still alive, you know, the, events would continue to happen. Uh, but I try to take all the research, all the interviews, and have a pretty simple method, which is I have one huge document, you know, searchable word document, and just put everything chronologically, and I can figure out where it is. And he never said, I'd like to see what you're doing? No, or? at the very beginning, I thought, you know, this guy, if you had to say seven adjectives, one of them would be control freakiness. And so I thought, all right, this is going to be bad because he's going to want control. He said, I know I want this to be an independent book. In fact, I want it to feel like not an in-house book. I will not even read it before you submit it uh, because I don't want to. I'll take no control over it. And even in my last, I think it was my last meeting with him, he was very, very ill. And um, he said to me, there'll be parts of this book I don't like. 
and it was more a question than a, and I said, yeah, yeah, definitely. And he said, well, don't worry, I don't want to get mad at you. I wanted this to be an independent book, so I won't read it for at least another year or another six months or whatever he said. And he has such a way of magical thinking, his ability to sort of almost a reality distortion field. I said to myself, oh, that's great. It means he's not about to, he will be alive mm -hmm. in another year or so. Uh, but of course he wasn't. But he couldn't completely control himself because he didn't like the picture oh, on the yeah. cover. Oh so yeah, so the uh, Simon & Schuster put uh, in the catalog about a year or so, a year and a half ago, a cover design, you know, just to, as a placeholder, which had Jobs in a little apple, you know, and it was kind of gimmicky. I think it said I, Steve. I arrived, and uh, you can date it by the fact that I think it was the uh, launch of the original iPad. So I flew into San Francisco. I was supposed to meet with Steve right beforehand, then be with him for the launch and spend a few days with him afterwards. Um, I get to the San Francisco airport and land, and the worst thing you ever want to see on your iPhone, if you're me, which was seven missed phone calls from Steve Jobs. Mm. Now, Steve never calls you back unless he really, you know, wants to. So I knew, not good. Um, so I finally, I'm standing there in that, you know, United Airlines concourse there, and, uh, and he just starts shouting. It's the only time I'd seen the really brutal side of his temper. He said, that is the ugliest cover. You have absolutely no taste. Uh, clearly, I don't even want to see you or deal with you again because it, you know, I can use this word, I guess, you know, it sucks. And then he used words that rhymes with sucks, but <laughs> I won't say here. Um, and, and I'm holding the phone out, and I, you know, I go, oh, God. Finally, he says, I don't even want to ever talk to you again unless you allow me to have some input and say on the cover design. I'm no fool. This took me about three quarters of a second to say, yes. I mean, here's the greatest industrial design and graphics design eye of our generation, and what he wants is the cover. And I tell you, it was near the end of his, you know, this went on, dragged on for a year or so afterwards, and he was quite sick. But we spent a lot of time going back and forth with me waiting. This is the Albert Watson picture that I had always wanted, taken for Fortune magazine in 2009. Helvetica type, which he insisted on, had graphic designers do it. And then just the original Mac I was talking about, a, um, Norman Seif did this for Rolling Stone. But it is a pure, simple a Apple design. I said, great, cool. So um, you mentioned a word in answering a question called reality distortion field. And frequently in the book, you say that one of his successes or one of his problems was that he always distorted reality. Correct. Could you explain what you meant by that phrase? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, it starts Wozniak, his partner. Before they're even partners, they have to do a game at Atari. And Steve wants. Um, uh, uh, was to help him create a new game that was called Breakout. Those of you are old enough, in fact, every one of you seems probably old enough to remember the game Pong, you know, where you, and uh, you hit a ball to the brick wall, and this is, uh, this is sort of uh, break, I mean, Pong, where you hit it back and forth. This was Breakout, which uh, is a one-person game. And Steve says, we have, we have to do it in four days. Waz says, you cannot do this in four days. This is going to take about a month to do the, he said, you can do it. You can do it in four days. And Waz said that was the whole reality distortion field. He would make you believe something impossible, but the key to understanding it is then you did it. You were able to do the impossible because he told you that. And it worked over and over again. You probably know quite well one of the great uh, industrial CEOs of our time, Wendell Weeks, who runs Corn and Glass. About three years ago, four or five years ago, Steve goes, he's trying to get he doesn't want the iPhone, which he's thinking about, hasn't yet come out. He doesn't want it in plastic. He thinks plastic. So he wants it a glass front, and he wants it to be really tough. And he's going to China where they're making the big glass plate. Oh, he didn't go, but he, where they make big glass plates in the Apple store. Finally, somebody says Corning might be able to do it. So he flies to Corning, New York, Steve does, sits there with uh, Wendell Weeks, and says, I want you to make a type of glass that would be so strong, boom, 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 boom. Wendell Weeks finally says, well, we had something called Gorilla Glass that we never manufactured, and he starts to try, and Steve says, no, 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 that's not how you do it. You want this, you know, he's just, got, and Wendell Weeks is pretty tough. He says, no, 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 I know how to make glass. Shut up and listen. So Jobs actually gets kind of pressed, shuts up and listen, and describes the, the way, the process for making Gorilla Glass. Steve says, great, the phone's coming out in September. I need this quantity by, you know, July. And so Wendell Weeks says, no, 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 we cannot do that. We actually have never made it before. We don't have a factory making it. 
<laughs> but it was a process we did once, and we think we could rather it'll take a year or two. And Steve says, don't be afraid. You can do it. Same thing he had said 25 years earlier to Waz. <laughs> Wendell Weeks said, I'm staring at this guy. You know, I'm thinking he's nuts. And then Wendell said, and I called our factory in Kentucky that was making, you know, windshields and stuff, and said, I want you to convert tomorrow to making Gorilla Glass. And so now every piece of glass on every iPhone, iPad, and iPod is made by Corning because he was able to convert it that night and had it out by July. That's the good side mm -hmm. of the reality distortion field. We go into the bad side as well, which is, you know, he would, didn't believe rules applied to him, and even when he's, say, diagnosed with cancer, he thinks he can reality distortion. Well, for example, when he was diagnosed with cancer, you point out in the book that he uh, spent nine months thinking that diet might solve the cancer problem, and after nine months he finally realizes maybe diet won't work. Could you go through why he just... Well, you know, there are two sides of Steve Jobs that always eventually intersect. The kind of counterculture, um, non-traditional, new age, rules don't apply to me guy who goes to India and learns intuition. And then the engineering business, very focused, pragmatic side. And whether it's his personal life or the products he makes or his cancer treatment, you have both of those strands happening. And it takes a while because he's looking for alternative treatments. But, as I say in the book, it didn't get quite as much pickup. He is also doing the most cutting edge traditional medicine. He's having his genome totally sequenced, I mean, his whole DNA sequenced, sequencing the cancer, trying to find out targeted drugs that could work. So, the problem is it took a few months longer right. than it should have as he's doing both. But do you believe today, or does his family believe, or did he ever think that had he gotten the treatment right away, as soon as he heard he had a tumor and gotten the treatment and had the operation, he would be alive today? I, I don't, you just don't know. He doesn't know. His doctors don't know. It could have metastasized at any point. It was a pancreatic cancer. There were people, Art Levinson, who was on his board, who was CEO of Genentech and others, who are pushing him, this, you've got to do this, this is a way to find And he does do it, and clearly, even the greatest scientists in the world wouldn't know. I, I, I'd, I'd not venture a guess there. Now, in your book, you don't really go through a lot of the uh, psychiatric situation, I guess, and I'm not a doctor, but it would seem like he was a classic bipolar, manic-depressive person, it, very effusive, very... Um, uh, 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 high energy, and then at times he's depressed and yelling at people, and he never thought he had that problem, or nobody ever addressed that? Well, as I say, I'm not an armchair psychiatrist. A lot of people, I have, one of the most common letters I get when people read my book, are people say, I'm a, you know, I know a lot about psychology, and his problem was, you know, ADD, or whatever it may be. Right. Uh, I don't do that. Um, he had an unbelievably complex personality, both intense, intensely focused and charming at times, but also intensely depressed, mad, and, you know, or, or difficult at times. I, he also, I asked him sort of, and stuff, he kind of shunned psychiatry and psychiatric drugs. He said, it will keep you from being who you are, which is why yeah. I've never done that. Now, I'm not advocating that, I'm just a biologist. One of the strands of his personality you write about in the book is that he was adopted, and he was given up for adoption by his uh, biological parents. It's a very interesting story how he tried to meet his biological mother at one point, and then didn't really want to meet his biological yeah. father. Can you describe that briefly? Yeah, he, uh, I think one of the keys to understanding Steve Jobs is his feeling that he was Rules didn't apply to him. He was special and a misfit. He didn't fit. And if you look at any Apple ad, you know, here's to the rebels, here's to the misfits, those that think different, that sort of thing. So uh, I, it, it partly stems, he thinks, I mean, we talked about it on a walk through his old neighborhood, uh, when he was four or five years old, and he knew he was adopted, didn't quite know what it meant, because his uh, parents, as Paul and Clara Jobs, who had adopted him, had always been honest with him. And the girl across the street says, oh, you were adopted, that means your real parents abandoned you and didn't want you. He said, I ran across the street, went into the house, and both my parents, you know, his adoptive Paul and Clara Jobs, say to him, no, no, you don't get it. We specifically picked you out. You are special, you are chosen, and stuff. He said, I always felt special and chosen, but also there's that abandoned thing. So in his 20s, after he's moderately successful and Apple has started, 
he really admits he's always been on a journey, and there's part of him that's all. He decided to find out who his um, birth mother was um, and couldn't. Hired a detective, nobody, it couldn't work out. And finally, he looks on his birth certificate, and there's the name of a doctor in San Francisco. He calls the doctor in San Francisco. The doctor says, I'm sorry, all of our, my records were destroyed in the fire. I can't tell you who your adoptive mother was. That was actually not true. That night, that doctor sat down and wrote a letter saying, to be delivered to Steve Jobs upon my death. Because he didn't want to break his whatever secrecy, but I guess he felt after his death. And in one, there's a, about a hundred coincidences that are really weird in his life. But the doctor dies like r real soon, like uh, <laughs> a few days later. I don't mean, I mean that funny. But um, and so the letter shows up, and Steve finds his mother, his uh, biological mother, Joanne Simpson, who uh, is living in Los Angeles at the time. His biological father had been a from uh, home Syria, which is the hotbed of the revolution now. In fact, you'll see some names, if you read about the, what's happening in Homs, of the John Dali family, J-A-N-D-A-L-I. That's his family. His father was Abdullah John Dali, like the ninth son of this very prominent family in Homs, uh, but abandoned him. So he tracks down the mother, Joanne Simpson, who starts crying and saying, I'm really sorry, but blah. he says, no, no, no. And she says, by the way, I have to call your sister. You have a sister we did not, we had you know, meaning Jandali and her, and we didn't put her up for adoption, and I raised her. And he calls this, she calls the sister, who turns out to be Mona Simpson, the great novelist, who then is not quite a great novelist, working at the Paris Review, George Plimpton's place in Manhattan, calls up, and being Joanne Simpson, if you ever read Mona's novel, which is called um, Anywhere But Here, it's about how wacky Joanne Simpson is, says, you have a brother, and she says, who? And says, I'm not going to tell you who he is. I'm going to bring him to you. I'll just give you, I'll just tell you this. He was very, very poor. Now he's really, really rich and famous and has dark hair and is good looking. So the entire Paris Review staff on the East 50s uh, decide to make a guessing game in the two or three days they're waiting. Who is Mona's brother? And they finally decide it's John Travolta. <laughs> so, um, no. Uh, Steve Jobs appears. He and Mona bond like this. I'm sorry, this is a long time. I'll speed it up. They decide, especially Mona, let's find the lost father. That's the name of the book. She even writes about it. The lost father, track him down, whatever. Finally, Mona, with the help of detectives, tracks him down. And he's running a coffee diner restaurant in Sacramento, California. Mona flies out to California, says to Steve, Go, let's go meet the dead. Steve says, I don't want to, but I'll meet you afterwards at this coffee shop, Cafe Roma, and you can tell me about it. To make matters even more complex for those who like coincidences or Freud or Shakespeare, Steve has had an illegitimate daughter when he was the exact same age as his father was and had pretty much at first abandoned this illegitimate daughter named Lisa, but then they had gotten back together. Lisa was then, you know, he was taking responsibility for. So he brings his illegitimate daughter, Lisa, uh, to this meeting. Uh, Mona goes to meet Jandali, running this coffee shop, and he, of course, starts crying, as everybody does in this book, and says, I wish you could have seen me in my heyday. I ran some really great restaurants. I even had a restaurant you know, near Cupertino that was the biggest restaurant in Silicon Valley. It was a great Mediterranean restaurant. Everybody used to eat there, even Steve Jobs. So Mona bites her tongue and doesn't say, Steve Jobs is your son, because he, she had sworn to secrecy. And, but she looks surprised, so John Dolly says, yeah, he was a good tipper. So anyway, uh, <laughs> Mona then goes, meets Steve later that day, tells the whole story. And Steve says, that fat, balding Syrian guy was my father? <laughs> I met him. I mean, he had been in the restaurant. Right. He had shaken hands. And Steve refused to meet with him again or ever see him. And so. It's a pretty odd tale. Well, you know, actually, a similar thing in your book on Albert Einstein, yeah. because Albert Einstein had so a child, illegitimate child, gave up for uh, adoption. He then marries the mother. They have another child, but they never go back and, and get the uh, other And Ben child. Franklin has an illegitimate child who he does take responsibility, but then who breaks with him and remains a loyalist during the revolution, and they never speak again and have this huge falling out. Kathy, my wife, Always oh, says, why do you keep writing about people who had affairs or illegitimate <laughs> children? 
And I said, look, it's only a coincidence. So, <laughs> um, where did the name Apple come from? It seems like an unusual yeah. name for Steve, a computer company. Steve, when he company. drops out of uh, college, Reed College, and goes on this pilgrimage to India, spends time with a couple of his um, Zen Buddhists, because they're all part of an ashram together, whatever, uh, and they work on an Apple commune in Oregon, uh, run by a guy he knew at Reed College, owned by a guy he knew at Reed. And he used to prune the apples, and it was part of a commune. He's coming back from that commune one day, back to um, Silicon Valley, and to meet Waz, because they were thinking of forming Apple. And Steve says, we'll call it Apple, unless we come up with a better name. And it was because he had just come back from the Apple commune. But he also said, look, it's a perfect disjuncture. Apple, computer. They don't quite go together. They make you double think. But it's kind of friendly as well as having a countercultural whiff to it. And then he said, and it got us ahead of Atari in the phone book. So, right. so <laughs> now when he worked at Atari, he had an employment at Atari, I guess for $5 an hour or something like yeah. that. He apparently showed up with no shoes, and he never showered, and didn't believe in deodorant. What was all that about? He felt that if he ate a fruitarian diet, because he was always on what he called my nutso diets, and after he came back from the apple orchard, he had read a book by, I think I'm an or something diet, it's a uh, that uh, called the mucusless diet, which means you don't even eat grains; you only eat fruit and vegetables. And he believed that if you followed such a diet, you wouldn't have any body odor. It was a mistaken theory. Um, <laughs> and so they put him on the night shift. <laughs> Al Alcorn and uh, Bushnell, who you probably right. remember, who ran Atari at the time, they think he's a pretty clever, cool engineer. But they put him on the night shift. Because nobody wanted to work with him. Nobody wanted to work with him. And he was, he was a bit of a handful then and later. Uh, but the good news is uh, Waz was working at HP just you know, a couple miles away. And Waz loved playing these video games. So he would come at night and play the games while Steve was. So they got two Steves for the price of one. So when they start the company, Wozniak and, uh, and uh, um, Steve Jobs, they start the company, does OK. They make a computer. It revolutionizes home computing and so forth. But then Steve Jobs gets kicked out of his own company. How did that happen? He started the company. How did he actually get kicked out? Yeah, um, a couple of things happen. Uh, the, he is so That's passionate. a phenomenon I've always observed is not a good idea to kick out a kicking founder. Out but people, yes, kicking out founders. Well, you're the expert there. Um, um, right. I'm sorry, I actually didn't, right. I didn't know I'm what that meant. I'm the expert in avoiding was, it. Yeah, uh, yeah, expert in not doing that. Um, He's a, he was a tough guy to work with, Steve Jobs. He was a demanding boss. He took the Mac team, which Apple II was the other product they had, which would make a lot more money, and that was Waz's baby. Um, but Steve becomes fanatic about the Mac, and he drives everybody nuts, so much so that they really need a CEO, so he helps recruit John Scully of PepsiCo. They have this father-son relationship for a while. They love each other, but it was, dest it was doomed, that relationship. And when the Mac comes out, Scully has overpriced it. It doesn't actually do that well after a few, the initial first right. few months. And the board, which is filled with father figures for Steve, you know, Arthur Rock, uh, Mike Markala, John right. Scully, eventually vote to kick him out on Memorial Day weekend of 85. All right, so he's kicked out, and he, then what does he do? He, yeah. he um, wanders around for a while, but he actually went and bought Pixar. Right. And how did he actually make Pixar into the company that it became? He paid about $10 million or so for it initially, and then it became a very valuable company. How did that happen? Yeah, George Lucas uh, sold the, uh, an, the digital division of his company, uh, which did two things big. One is it made a machine called the Pixar machine that rendered uh, animation digitally. And the other was it had software, so that RenderMan it was called. You can, you know, sort of help it. But they had one guy sitting at the company, a young guy who had been, loved the Disney company, had worked there, but been laid off at Disney, named John Lasseter. And his job was to make short animated films to show off how cool the hardware and software was. And so he made something called Tin Toy, and he has this dream of doing things. And Steve realizes the hardware ain't working, the software, but this guy is an artist. Steve was hard to deal with at times, but if you were an artist and you were passionate about perfection, he loved you. So Steve bonds with this guy, John Lasseter, and eventually just keeps writing the check until the guy makes Toy Story. 
And um, while he was doing that, Apple wasn't doing that well. Eventually, they call him up and say, yeah, the other like to things, buy your company, why the, don't you come back? How yeah, the other happen? thing Steve did was start another company called Next, which was a computer company that indulged all of Steve's best and worst instincts, meaning it was perfectly designed with a $100,000 logo by Paul Rand, a perfect cube, uh, totally powerful, totally overpriced, and totally impractical, and was a flop, but it had a wonderful operating system based on Unix, and Apple, which had coasted along for a few years after Steve's death, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, after Steve left, uh, and, um, but by the late, uh, by, by the mid to late 1990s, couldn't even create an operating system for itself. There was the Apple operating system had not been upgraded. It was down to 4% of the market compared to Windows OS from Microsoft. And they needed it, so they had to buy an operating system. And Gil Abelio, who was then the CEO of Apple, grits his teeth and buys uh, Next for the operating system. But you buy Next for the operating system, you also buy it, and you get Steve Jobs back. And as Wozniak said when I talked to him about it, Gil Emilio meets Steve Jobs, game over. Within six months, Emilio was gone. Well, he became, well, Steve became the CEO again, and then as soon as he became the CEO, he said that the entire board would just gave him the job, you're, you're all should leave? Yeah, you got to get out of here, including Mike Markle, his original angel investor. So Apple is back under Steve's uh, domain, um, but the series of products that changed the world in many ways, or at least uh, some people did think so, the iPod, the iPad, the iPhone, how did they come about? The iPod, whose idea was that? Was that Steve Jobs' idea, or where did that come from? Well, first of all, what the key to understanding Apple is the control freakish nature of Steve uh, gives them the desire to have end-to-end -end control of products, unlike Microsoft, which will license out you know, Windows to every hardware maker from HP to Compaq to Dell. Uh, they want to integrate everything, which is not very open. People can be against that system. But it makes for an easier user experience if everything's integrated. So they do that for four years or so after Steve comes back. And then they realize we're successful again. It's the iMac and others successful. And that end-to-end -end integration means we can do something that nobody else can, which is there are a lot of MP3 music players kicking around the market, but they're complicated. They have to fit into Windows systems, other systems fit into different types of computers, so they have a complexity built into them because they have to work with every computer and you have to make your playlists on the actual device. And he said, all music, we love music, all music players totally suck. We're going to create one that will be pure and simple because we have that end-to-end -end integration. And so really within a year, they find a way to do the iPod and he keeps saying, make it simpler, make it, he has a rule, which is I want to get to every, anything I want, any song or whatever, within three clicks, and it's got to be intuitive and no manual. And so, you know, they'd look at the interface. If you look even at Windows, at Microsoft Word 2010, it has more stupid buttons and things that make you do things and final, mar all it. Steve kept saying simplify, simplify, simplify. So Everything's in three clicks. As, you know, there was a screen saying, do you want to search by artist, song, whatever. He said, why do we need that screen? We don't need that screen. And finally, when he does a track wheel and everything else, they have only one button, which is on and off. And Steve asks the most brilliant question is, why do we need that button? Why do you need an on-off button? If people stop using it for five minutes, it can slowly power down and go dormant but you don't even need that button. So the iPod is a absolute zen-like product of beautiful design, and that starts stemming the consumer products. Business. So the iPhone, um, whose idea was it to have a, a smartphone? Well, phone? so uh, if you're doing the iPod, all of a sudden it's like 20% of Apple's, it is a huge success. And if you're a normal person running a company, you're happy. Steve is panicked and upset. Because he says, what could cannibalize us? What could kill us? What can kill us is if people who make phones come up and are smart enough to know how to put the music in the phone. Because people don't want to carry two things around. So as soon as some telephone manufacturer is smart enough of putting it on your Blackberry or your Motorola Razor or whatever it may be, uh, we'll be screwed. And so he says, 
before we get cannibalized, I mean, before we get cannibalized, we'll cannibalize ourselves. We're going to make an iPod that is also a phone. And uh, he did that. And the iPad, they were actually working on the iPad before the iPhone. Yeah. But did he was they working ever, on, yeah. Did they, did they ever dream that the iPad would become what it became? No, otherwise they probably would have done it first. What happened was they were looking at the iPad, uh, and he was particularly annoyed that somebody worked for Bill Gates. And in fact, they were at a dinner together. This guy who worked for Microsoft, Bill Gates, Steve. And this guy's going on and on about Microsoft has a tablet, it's got a stylus, and we're going to put all these computer people out of business. Steve says, Any, once you put a stylus on, already you have one extra thing. We, God gave us 10 styluses. We don't need an extra one. And this guy was such an asshole, I decided we were going to do our own tablet and show them how to do it. And so what they come up with is instead of a stylus, it's, you know, multi-touch. You know, a touch screen in which you can do everything and not only touch it, but use many fingers and touch it, which we call multi-touch. Well, and okay. they come up with that idea, and at the time they were wrestling with how to make the iPod's track wheel work for making it a phone, and it didn't work well. And so Steve says, let's go for the way we want to do it, let's take multi-touch and use it for the phone. Well, the multi-touch was maybe invented by some people from Delaware, had a Correct. small company. Um, many of the things works. in the other things that Apple did were really technologies that other people had invented. Did they actually invent anything at Apple that was really new, or they just were taking other things and packaging them better? You know, Malcolm Gladwell wrote a good, really good piece on my book for the New Yorker calling, him the calling Jobs the Tweaker, which makes the point that he didn't invent everything, he just tweaked what other people invented. Uh, there's some truth to that, although I think the word tweaker is far too diminishing for what that was. In the end, you can start at the very beginning when he goes to Xerox Park, sees a graphical user interface that Xerox has developed, and says, I want this for the Mac. He takes it and improves it tenfold. I mean, you couldn't drag and drop folders on the Xerox Star or the Alto that they did. And Xerox put out a computer with that graphical interface well before the Mac came out, and it totally flopped. So, uh, as T.S. Eliot said, between the conception and the reality falls the shadow. That's a big deal, is being able to right. execute something right. Now, yeah, they buy something Fingerworks and buy the rights to multi-touch right. from it. They buy many things, including the guts of the MP3 player comes from another company. But you, you all, everybody in this room, is in businesses like that. The question of making it work is what counts. Now talk about the retail. Um, most people said that you don't have your own retail stores oh, if yeah. you're the computer business or the, the kind of business they were in. Whose idea was it to have those retail stores and who designed them? That was totally Steve's idea because, as I said, he liked to control things from end to end. And, you know, at the moment in the iPhone or iPad, he even controls the chip. I mean, they make the ARM microprocessor all the way through the hardware, all the way through the software, all the way through what was announced this morning, which is the uh, iBook 2 and iTunes Store and iTunes U new software. He controls everything, hardware to software, but there's one thing he's not controlling, which is the experience of buying the thing. Because you go to a big box store back 10 years right. ago, and it's Best Buy, and the you know clerk gets a spiff from Compaq or HP, or whatever, and he's pushing one computer to the other. So he says, I want to control the retail experience. He goes to the board. The board says, that's a really dumb idea. Gateway is collapsing because they've tried to build too many stores. He decides, as usual, to totally ignore the board, but he brings Mickey mm -hmm. Drexler in from the Gap to join the board. Mickey Drexler says, you can do it, but do one thing first, which is build a prototype first. So um, he finds Ron Johnson, who was then at Target, and it brought you know that beautiful design sensibility to Target stores. Um, and they walk the Stanford Mall and look at the stores and figure out that stores are supposed to be a statement, that they're supposed to be absolutely simple, and the two of them just obsess for a year and focus on building the perfect store. Now you say he walked with him. Uh, Steve Jobs apparently loved to walk with people. That's how he made the yeah. decision. You walked with him, he walked yeah. with everybody. What was all that about? I, I don't really know. I guess we all, as Bill Gates said when uh, he went down to visit him once and Steve was furious because this very early on thought that Gates had ripped off the graphical user interface when he was creating Windows in 85. Uh, he said he insisted on going a walk for me, which is not a management technique I use. <laughs> but I think Steve liked to focus and if you were walking and talking, you just got him really going. What was his relationship with Steve? with uh, Bill Gates. Um, the most complicated, wonderful, interesting relationship you could imagine. 
It's like I said in the book of the binary star system in astronomy where two stars have such a gravitational pull that they are linked in orbit in a way. It begins in the early 80s when Microsoft's a tiny company and Apple II is taking off as a much bigger company, Apple, and Gates and others are writing the software for it. He keeps coming down to Cupertino to meet with him. And he said, I saw the reality distortion field. I mean, it's just, you know, he just told me amazing stories in it. In the end, though, the more important thing than just what a personality love-hate relationship they had with each other is the fact that they represent the two um, different sides of the digital debate. Apple being the most closed of all models, which is you make the hardware, the software, and it's totally integrated, and you don't license out the Apple operating system for somebody else to put on their hardware. Bill Gates, of course, licenses out everything. For, you know, it's not exactly open, but it, it means you can use his operating, his software on any devices, whatever. And both those models work, and you see in that fight right now where Android is the open model compared to Apple OS, which is a closed. So they have this fight, their whole career over this, but you mentioned Steve coming back in 97. First phone call he makes on my, is to Bill Gates, saying, I've come back to save Apple. you got to come save it with me. Bill Gates, great rival, but also great, flies down, says, OK, we're going to do it, agrees to invest, agrees to be at that great Macworld in Boston on the screen talking about it. Uh, the other call he made was a John Warnock at Adobe saying, you got to do this for me. Adobe says, no, you got too small of a market share. We're not going to make pho Photoshop and Director and all the things for the new Mac operating system. Steve never forgave them. So if you pull out your iPhone and wonder why Adobe Flash doesn't work, <laughs> it will never work on your iPhone or iPad. Because to the very end, you touch the button of Adobe and he rents. So in the end, he and Gates right. still get close. And if I may go on on the sure. final. Near the end, when Steve is very sick, I actually, um, Gates wanted to come visit him down in Cupertino and was trying to arrange it. And Steve is not the nicest person in the world, but still intense, you know. He's, he finally says, well, I'll use a polite word, what a jerk. Um, the word he used began with A. Uh, he thinks I'm dying, he wants to come visit. He wouldn't do it. But finally, Bill Gates arrives in Cupertino and just comes to the house, knocks on the back door, there's Eve, the youngest daughter, doing her homework. She's like 11. Doesn't quite even know who Bill Gates is. But Bill Gates, and Gates says, where's your father? And Eve points to the downstairs room where Steve was then living. And uh, they talk for four hours about, you know, being the pillars of this age. And uh, finally at the end, uh, Bill Gates, who's very, very gracious, says to Steve, you know, I never thought the integra integrated end-to-end -end model was going to work, but you proved it could work. And Steve, who's not very gracious, but at this point says, well, you proved that your model could work as well. And I'm thinking as a biographer, because I'm around and I'm hearing both sides of this right away in almost real time, getting the debrief on this meeting, I thought, what a wonderful sort of final scene where they all make up in the sun, you know. <laughs> so, but then Gates says to me, you know, one thing I didn't say to him was, it works, but it only works if you have a Steve Jobs mm -hmm. doing it, an artist with a passion for perfection. It was Steve's artistic sensibility and his, you know, perfectionism that made that integrated model work. And I thought, well, that's sweet. So I tell Steve Jobs this on my next right. <laughs> Steve looks at me and says, I'll use the word this time, uh, what an asshole. Mm -hmm. He said, he could, anybody could make the end end model work. He could have made it work, it's just that he has no taste. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I say, well, it goes the sweet ending of the book. But I say to him, but you said to uh, Steve that, I mean, uh, Steve, you said to Bill that the Microsoft, his model worked as well. And I said, yeah, of course it works. But it only works if you don't care about making crappy products. That's all Microsoft ever made was crappy products. <laughs> So, Steve, you couldn't get that sort of the end. hallelujah chorus at the end. So, Bill Gates uh, retired at uh, maybe 50 years old and devoted himself to philanthropy. Why did Steve Jobs seem to have no interest in philanthropy? And what's going to happen to no all the money that he left? Yeah. Steve had no strong interest in philanthropy publicly in particular, meaning whatever he gave, he gave very quietly. Um, and Gates asked him to do the giving pledge, which Steve refused to sign. Uh, uh, Steve Jobs' wife is very, very interested in philanthropy and been a great leader in the education reform movement. 
But when Steve and I talked about even education and Bill Gates' philanthropy, what they were doing in education, so I could focus on that and try to reinvent philanthropy or whatever. Or I could focus on what I do best. And I suspect, this is me talking, not him, that the iPad will do more to reform education than all mm -hmm. of, say, mm -hmm. the Packard Foundation and Gates Foundation education programs. And even today, when you go home tonight, you'll read uh, that they released a textbook maker for iBooks as well as uh, iTunes University, which will totally disrupt the textbook industry. It was one of the right. last things he talked to me about in the book, and I have it in the book, his desire to get rid And so textbooks will be interactive and all that. So in some ways, that's what he'll do. As for his money now, it's, it's I, something I do not know. After all the time you spent with him, do you admire him more than you did before you, you started the book? And, or did you come to um, dislike him a bit because of all the things you learned about him? Well, yes and yes. Um, I, I admire him more. I thought, oh man, what an absolute, you know, because I thought, okay, he's one of 20 people who really helped. But you look at the field, starting with the personal computer, uh, you know, then music business, and then now the textbook business, but the retail store business, the digital animation. He just transformed multiple industries repeatedly, the phone industry. Uh, secondly, he did it by leaps of the imagination and genius, or ingeniousness, I think. Uh, and I began to totally respect his focus, his passion for perfection. I also came to see that the passion for perfection and passion for product is related to the sort of petulance and impatience and toughness. I don't think you have to be that way to be a right. passion for perfection, but he was that way. So I respected him enormously. After my book came out and after Steve Jobs died, there was a gathering of all the original Mac team or whatever, and they were reading the book and talking about it, and also, and they did the same question you did, which is, in the end, did you like him? And the, que and the answer was, well, we sure respected him, and we sure would not have given up the chance to have been on that ride with him for anything in the world. And your book has now sold more than a million and a half copies. It's been number one bestseller since it came out. Um, it might even become a movie. Mm -hmm. um, uh, who are you going to write about next? How can you top what you've just done? And did you ever expect the book would sell this, this much when you first started? Well, writing? let me just digress on the selling, because I know your interest in China, and we were just talking about it. And somewhat unsurprisingly, it's just selling very well in China, where you know, it's in translated into 53 languages now. Or? Yeah, but um, so Sitchik, the Chinese publisher, and I thought I am doing my best for the American economy because I am teaching an entire new generation of Chinese students, millions of them, that if they want to succeed, what they should do is drop out of college. Mm -hmm take a lot of acid, uh, and be a jerk to their supervisors. And so I, I hope to be able to transform right, the right. Chinese well, economy. Well, Steve, uh, as, <laughs> Steve uh, Jobs said you can't really understand him unless you've taken acid. So do you think you really understand him? <laughs> no. Okay, okay, that's the right <laughs> answer. That's for a safe answer, too. Um, as for next, which what, what your next book. Yeah, I'm still kicking it around. Um, as I initially thought, after doing Kissinger as well as this, I think I want to go way back in history and not have to. Uh, I was thinking of doing Ada Lovelace, who most of you wouldn't know. Ada Byron Lovelace was Lord Byron's daughter. Lady Byron was not particularly fond of Lord Byron by the time she was growing up, and decided she should become a mathematician so she wouldn't be a poet. She becomes a great mathematician and writes the um, first computer programs and algorithms for Charles Babbage's difference engine and analytic engine in the 1840s. So I was thinking of doing that. I, don't th I think that's not a whole book, but I want to start with that. And I'm thinking of doing an entire history. This is a larger project of the digital revolution. Beginning with that as the prelude, but then in 1947, December, right. when Bardeen and Shockley and others invent the transistor at Bell Labs, and it would have, like the wise men did, six or seven friends interweaving, obviously Bill Gates, right. Steve Jobs, among others. But it would be everything from that to the internet to gaming and how all of this, the creativity and innovation that didn't have one Edison-like inventor, 
but how this creativity of the past uh, 50 years of the digital revolution came to pass. We have time for a few questions in case anybody, Mark Ein. Speak up. Not that you're shy. I'll repeat. But, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. At the end of the book, in the part where you sort of comment, give your personal views, you say that you think he's infused in the Apple DNA something that for decades will put it at the forefront of artistry and technology. By the time I'd gotten that book, I actually sort of had the opposite feeling that at every critical step along the way, even at the end, that his imprint really was what put them on the right course. And um, I'm interested in your views on where do you think will happen to Apple, how it will yeah. be different with you that know, in there. Uh, the theme of the book is how to be at the intersection of creativity and technology, art and sciences. Every product demonstration he did ended with a slide of this intersection of a uh, street called, you know, the humanities and the street called the sciences. He said, that's what Edwin Land at Polaroid taught me. I want to stand at that intersection. And I want Apple to. So at the last board meeting in August, when he's stepping down, uh, after he reads his letter of resignation as CEO, some of the board starts gloating about HP, Hewlett Packard that day, having gotten out of the computer and the tablet business and totally being screwed up. And Steve says, don't gloat. This is ridiculous. Bill Hewlett gave me my first job when I was age 13 and uh, wanted up. And he and Packard created a company that they thought would last for generations. And these bozos have now screwed it up. I don't want that to happen at Apple. We have got to stand a generation from now at the intersection of you know creativity and technology. He has a roadmap of uh, products. I have two paragraphs, I think, in my book about how he wanted to revolutionize the textbook industry. That was announced today. I think there's a couple more years of things that both he thought about. I think uh, Phil Schiller, Johnny Ive, Tim Cook, Scott Forstall, and Eddie Q, and others truly get it. So I think Apple will be fine for the foreseeable future while people who truly get it are still running it. Uh, but it's like the Disney company. Walt Disney, who was also a difficult character, but also stood at the intersection of, of you know, the sciences and the arts. Uh, that company went up and down a few times, but it's still encoded in the Disney DNA, what Walt Disney was all about. And I suspect and hope that will be true of Apple with the Jobs okay. DNA. One more question, okay. Yes, uh, Bill Shokek, Gilbane Company on succession. Was Tim Cook his clear successor? And what about the uh, $1 compensation for Steve versus what we've read about with uh, Tim Cook? Uh, Tim was always the perfect complement to Steve. Uh, he is a measured, thoughtful, um, quiet, calm, you know, person who could do everything Steve didn't do, you know, and, and so they were a perfect pairing. I think that Steve discussed, um, as he properly should have, and the board told me he did, succession ideas all the way through for the past few years and how it would work. And I think it was always a combination of things, but it was always clear that the CEO would be at least, you know, if as it happened this time, uh, Tim Cook. And uh, as for the compensation, there's a very, uh, you know, theme in the book, small theme, on Steve Jobs and money, because he was not driven by money. He said, I was incredibly poor and penniless, wandering around India with not enough money to, you know, buy even, you know, rice. Uh, and then I was incredibly rich, you know, hundreds of millions a few years later. And so I've never had much of a driving, money be much of a driving force. So he worked for a dollar a year, but he always insisted on repricing stock options and other things, which, as you know, caused some investigation. So it was a complex relationship to money. Um, but in the end, Steve never got driven by money, and the proof is in the fact that, uh, you know, if you look at the Forbes list, there are a lot of people who didn't create the world's now second most, but when Steve stepped down, it was the world's most valuable company, period. Uh, and, you know, there are 20, 30 people ahead of him on that list who haven't created the world's most right. valuable company. I don't think Tim Cook is also driven by money, but I don't, I think he's much more conventional in taking a conventional, you know, compensation. Walter, I want to thank you very much you. for this. I'm going to give you a gift. Hold on one All second. Right. Here.
Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, Thank wow. You. The first map of the Low District low. of Columbia. Oh, sorry. First map of the District of Columbia.